Uh, yes, sir. We are live now. Please start. Thanks, Thanks Balaji. Okay. All right. Uh, those who are here, welcome um, to this live interaction. So uh, today we are talking about, uh, I guess, the um, the session on um, research design. And I'm hoping everyone here has seen the video, the lecture. Um, and as you know, if you're answering, if you want to answer the questions that you pose, um, just studying statistics is not enough, but you have to understand basically of research design. So in the lecture, I talk about uh, what research design is for, uh, what are the purposes of research design, and then how do we uh, sort of try and ensure that those purposes are met uh, including one major purpose is uh, that uh, generalizability. So when you take a sample from a population, you don't really care about the sample as such. The sample is not important in as much, uh, except as so far as it allows you to tell, uh, to say something about the population as a whole. So I will measure 50 trees, the heights of 50 trees. Uh, those 50 trees aren't very important, right? I could have chosen another 50 trees uh, or another 50 or another 50. But what I want through those 50 trees is to get an understanding of all the trees that I've not measured. That's the key thing, I think, insight in research design, is we want to infer something about the unmeasured part of the population from the measured part of the population. And usually the measured part of the population is quite small. And so we need to be very careful about <clears throat> how we choose which uh, units, which sampling units to actually choose and to measure. And if you do it in the right way, in a representative way, then you are able to make that generalization. You're able to infer something about the population. And if you do it in the wrong way, in other words, in a biased way, for example, then you'll come up with a measure, you'll come up with an estimate of the heights of trees, but it'll be a biased estimate. And the, the frightening part is you won't even know it's a biased estimate uh, because nobody knows what the population height is, uh, the mean height. Uh, and so you only know whether your measure is, is uh, reasonable or not based on how sensible your research design is. So it's really important. So the two major things are the, you know, how you sample from the population. And the other thing is your sample size, how, which determines your precision, you know, how close you might be, your sample mean might be to the population mean. We talked about that. And then also about uh, some uh, principles of, um, if I remember correctly, of uh, experimental design uh, and um, fundamentals of what experiments are about and how we can make experiments as meaningful as possible, as informative as possible. Because in experiments, we want to infer things about cause and effect. And there are many, it's not so straightforward. There are many things, many aspects to it. And of course, the aspects that I've explained in the lecture are also not everything to know about research design or experimental design. There's more. But I like to think at least that what uh, what's in the lecture is sort of the, the, the most important fundamental uh, ideas and if you internalize that and you understand them then uh, you should be able to carry out pretty reasonably well designed studies be they observation studies or experimental studies and I think finally in the lecture uh, also there's a part about how we might be able to infer uh, cause and effect even if we are unable to do experiments of course that's always going to be there's always going to be a question mark uh, in the absence of a of a true experiment but still, how can we maximize our ability to infer cause even if we can't 100% nail it? So these were the parts of the uh, the lecture. I, there are a couple of questions that have already come in um, on the um, uh, in the spreadsheet in the in the form that uh, was available for people to fill. Uh, so I'll just look at those, and then um, if anybody here has any questions about research design whether it's about the lecture itself or going beyond the lecture, then uh, you know, you're know you free to ask. And maybe since we're such a small group, you can just unmute and ask. But for now, let me just look at the two questions. Uh, <clears throat> one is how would I design the sampling in mangrove habitats and support for long-term monitoring of the habitat? So this is not really a question about mangrove habitats. It's any kind of, you know, how might one sample within any habitat uh, for let's say long-term monitoring. And I, I think that it's there's nothing very different from the lecture here. If we want to, uh, uh, in the long term, be able to track what's happening with mang the mangrove habitat as a whole, or whatever habitat, grassland, forest, or whatever habitat it is, 
then we need to A, choose a representative sample, and B, we need to monitor that sample uh, in the same way using a consistent protocol over uh, time, over years. Um, so the first thing, a representative sample, we've, we've talked about, um, you might use a, a simple random sampling. Uh, let's say you are sampling uh, in plots of, let's say, 10 by 10 uh, meters, if you're sampling trees, or you could be sampling um, individual trees, or if you're looking at birds, then you might have points or transects, or if you're looking at fish, you might have a different way of sampling. You might do it with nets. So that is up to the details of what it is you want to sample this precise technique. But the question is, where do you apply that technique? Do I put the net here or there? Do I lay the transect here or there? Uh, and so on. <clears throat> so there we need to either um, use a simple random uh, sampling design, which as I explained in the lecture is fragile if we have a small sample size, because then we can uh, end up at random with a very unrepresentative part of the habitat all our points by chance lie in one corner of the mangrove uh, forest, or all our points lie by chance in more open parts and not in the more dense parts and so on. And so then if that is the case, we have a small sample size, then we need to either stratify um, by density of uh, the, the trees or stratify by some other known thing, maybe by species composition of the mangroves. There are a couple of different species perhaps of trees, mangrove, uh, that are there, we need to stratify. And there could be other ways of stratifying. Or we use a systematic uh, random sampling. So we, let's say we divide the area up into a grid, and then we um, choose in some uh, way uh, which grids to um, uh, to measure. Or we choose, uh, we measure every alternate grid, and within that grid, we put in a random point, something like that. So that is about the representativeness. And then, of course, in the long term, if you want to understand what's happening with the trees or the birds or the fish or, or invertebrates or whatever that's there, then in each of these places, whatever we're doing, whether it's transects or points or, or nets, you need to ensure that over time, uh, from year to year to year or month to month, or whatever your, uh, frequency you're monitoring at, you have to use the same technique in the same way. And especially with long-term monitoring, just one thing, uh, um, that it's really important to write down the protocols because even if the same person is doing the monitoring year to year, after five years, they'll they'll drift in their understanding of what is to be done. How am I supposed to measure the height of this tree? Or <clears throat> what am I supposed to do with these uh, snails or crabs that are in front of me? How do I classify them into different size classes? Unless that's written down and documented formally, it's going to drift in the same person's understanding and it's especially a problem if different people will be involved over the years. So maybe there's somebody involved for the first two years and then somebody else replaces the person in the third and fourth and fifth years, then unless something is written down. So basically we have to do whatever we can to ensure the protocol is followed uh, exactly. Uh, so representation, representativeness, and then the consistent protocol. These are two things for long-term monitoring. Uh, so that's uh, question number one. Question number two, I don't think is for me. It's a question is, are habitat specialists usually endemic? Um, not sure which of the faculty this is. Um, but uh, no, uh, the answer is no, they are not uh, usually endemic. Uh, because you can have grassland specialists who are found in, and grasslands are found widely distributed, so they need not be uh, endemic to a particular area. Uh, endemic species usually are endemic because of a combination of both ecological factors and historical factors. <clears throat> uh, and also with barriers, barriers to dispersal, uh, such that they are unable to uh, spread in their distribution beyond uh, a particular confined area. So Western Guards endemics are endemic to the Western Guards because at some point, uh, they there was a more continuous distribution, typically between the Himalayas and of habitat, in Himalayas and the mountains of the Western Ghats, but that continuous distribution has been fragmented and broken. And so they don't uh, are unable to um, uh, spread back. And so they evolve into different species. There's a barrier to dispersal. And so they're only found in one place. But this is beyond the <laughs> remit of my, my particular lecture on uh, research design. 
so i guess it's over to all of you uh, maybe how many of you uh, perhaps eight or nine of you who are the learners here the rest are uh, tas i think or um, so if you have any questions about research design then we can deal with those and if you have only a few questions or no questions about research design then you can we can discuss anything you like anything in ornithology that is or in science not of course the state of the world and politics and so on so, yeah uh, so uh, there is one question in the discussion forum i am not sure whether it's directly related to the ah, okay. basic of research design yes so uh, shall i read it out loud could you could you yes please ha, ha, ha. so it's from sachin and uh, he's asking uh, i have observed a lot of black drongos near the burning grass why what does it indicate are they gathered to eat insects coming out of the ground okay yeah not research related to research design sonia but mm -hmm. fair enough i think it's a really interesting observation and you'll see not only black black drongos are some of the most prominent species when there's a fire but there are all kinds of other species as well cattle egrets and lots of smaller species and uh, exactly so what the fire is doing is it's flushing out uh, insects from the ground and from the vegetation and the insects are trying to escape the fire and uh, they land in the mouths of the of the drongos so the same thing happens uh, in less drastic or less dramatic ways when cattle egrets and drongos follow cattle or elephants or gaur as they walk through the grass <clears throat> and the insects get flushed the grasshoppers get flushed out and then they become visible to the birds and then the birds uh, are able to catch them and eat them so the fire acts as a more uh, intense uh, kind of uh, cattle herd uh flushing out the insects and making them available to birds who otherwise would not have been able to find them hidden in the shrubbery so for that brief period of time that there's a fire some of these birds really have a good time uh, but then of course it takes a long time it takes some time for the vegetation to come back so that insects can be supported so maybe in the long term it's not as good for the birds as it is in the short term thanks so is there anything else uh, in the discussion i haven't looked at it for a little while i have to admit so now i'm muted i don't know if you're speaking ha 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 yeah <laughs> i have also forgot to unmute so no like uh, questions directed to related to your um, okay lecture but ha huh. uh, i think there is uh, one question from sachin itself it's a general question i guess but uh, if you are okay we can address it here like sure, it's yeah. regarding the nest predation so sachin is asking how did nest predation evolve is it due to reduction in resources or is a general threat of winds or something else uh i i suspect nest predation is like any predation you know uh, birds uh, well not birds but their nest predators are all kinds you know they're mammals they're reptiles they're birds um and uh, they are sometimes uh, opportunistic you find you happen to find a nest with eggs or chicks and you then eat them and sometimes they are deliberately found for example snakes will look out for nests uh and will um will kind of make a specific attempt to reach nests and then eat the eggs and chicks so uh I'm not sure i fully understand the question but nest predation is pretty much like any other any other predation and of course the birds have evolved various ways to try and minimize nest predation but uh, but nest predation is typically very high the rates of nest predation on bird uh, nests are, are fairly high uh, they can be up to 90% in other words 90% of nests are depredated and only 10% ex escape predation and this is true even for birds whose nests we think are well protected like uh, uh weaver birds by our weaver birds which i uh, studied for my phd they have extremely high rates of nest predation even though you think they are at the edges of thorny you know branches of thorny trees or way high above water and and they should escape nest predation but that's not uh, that's not necessarily the case um so birds are pretty lucky if their nest rate of nest predation or the probability of their nest being uh, depredated is less than 50% um Uh, and that's of course why birds have to be fecund especially smaller birds they have multiple clutches in a year if they can they lay multiple eggs uh, as a kind of insurance um, and and so on and so forth 
Sonia, there's a green box around your name there. Again, are you speaking on mute? I can't tell. Okay. I think we're so we're we're out of um, we've run out of questions for me to answer. <laughs> so uh, I'm really sorry. My I think the network is program is very this thing <laughs> unstable. So yeah, okay. I'm cutting it out from the link again and again. So did I miss anything? So uh, no, uh, I I just wanted yeah. to throw it open now to the people who are here. Um, if you have a question about research design, let's prioritize that because that's the topic of this week. Uh, but uh, if you have other questions, um, if there aren't any questions about research, then once we uh, exhaust those, then anything else or any discussion points um, that you have, please feel free to bring it up. And you can unmute, by the way, huh? because we have so few people don't have to type it in chat. So I think, Sonia, there are people are able to unmute themselves, no? Yes. Yeah. Okay. One comment, lecture very lucid, very kind of you. Thank you so much. Normally lucid lectures um, lead to more questions and very opaque lectures, you know, people don't feel like asking questions. So, <laughs> let's see, there's some other questions. Uh, sir, if you can uh, highlight a little bit about uh, uh, pseudo replication, so that will be helpful. Yeah, thank you there for that question. This is a difficult uh, concept, uh, pseudo replication. Um, and just to reiterate what I said in the in the lecture, so basically, if two sampling units are mm, expected to be more similar to each other than other <clears throat> sampling units, then that's often a problem of pseudo replication. So, for example, um, in social surveys, in surveys of opinions, political opinion, for example, uh, people who conduct these polls may um, go, you know, find people to answer questions. You know, do you agree with this policy? Do you support this political party, and so on? And when they do that, they're usually very careful not to ask two members of the same household, because on average, two members of the same household tend to share similar views. So I don't want to overrepresent multiple people who, for other reasons, share similar views. I want to rather survey people from different households, from different backgrounds and, and so on, so that I can generalize better to the uh, larger population. Similarly, if I want to measure, let's say, growth rate of uh, chicks or immune response of chicks, I would uh, rather, if I could measure 10 chicks, I would rather measure one chick each from 10 different nests, not uh, four chicks from this nest and four chicks from another nest and two chicks from a third nest, because then I'm only measuring chicks from three nests, so three families, because it's very likely that many uh, anatomical and physiological characteristics of chicks are going to be shared within siblings. They're very similar within siblings. So that's another uh, situation of pseudo replication. If I ignore that fact, and if I, uh, I have three nests and I measure uh, all the chicks in each nest and treat each of those chicks as an independent data point, as an independent replicate. So I wouldn't want to do that. And that generalizes to other uh, kinds of situations. In experimental <clears throat> studies, for example, um, I might have an incubator in which I'm incubating, let's say, turtle eggs at different temperatures. And you know that many reptiles have uh, temperature-based sex determination. And so depending on what the temperature during incubation is, the, the eggs hatch out as either male or female. And then if I'm studying a species where we don't know what this temperature-based sex determination is, then I have incubators where I have them at different temperatures, let's say two incubators, one at uh, a lower and one at a higher temperature. And I put in 100 eggs in the low incubator and 100 eggs in the high incubator. And then I see what sex ratio emerges from these two incubators. But the problem is that this is also a case of pseudo replication because all the 100 uh, eggs in each incubator share all the conditions of that incubator, not just the temperature. So, for example, uh, suppose uh, the person uh, who was using the incubator before me uh, cleaned out the incubator with, um, 
I don't know, with alcohol, ethanol, but happen to leave that sponge or the cotton over there, right? So now that one incubator has a lower temperature, but also has ethanol fumes in it. And all 100 eggs are going to be affected in the same way. Or let's say one incubator, the, the power switched off uh, by chance, it failed. Uh, or or the um, stabilizer you know didn't work or something and all the eggs are affected in the same way um this is different and so therefore anything that happens to one incubator any condition affects all 100 eggs so now i don't know whether the uh, difference in sex ratio between incubator 1 and incubator 2 is because of the temperature that i've set or because of some other shared condition which i may or may not know about so this is also a case where uh, some people would argue, rather than having a sample size of 100 and 100 in the two temperature conditions, actually you have only a sample size of 1 and 1. And so to actually to have truly different replicates, we need to have multiple incubators at low temperature and multiple incubators at higher temperature. Uh, and those incubators need to be delinked from each other, uh, if you know what I mean. So there's a lot that can be said about pseudo replication, but I hope these few examples you know, give a little bit of an idea about how we have to worry about uh, our different replicates uh, 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 providing independent sources of information to the analysis and to the inference that we want to make. Sir, many times uh, I find this confusing with the confounding factors. Sorry, I... Yeah, uh, many times uh, I find this as a confounding factor rather than the pseudo replication. Ah, so uh, well, in this case, it is it is confounding, but the confound itself creates the pseudo replication. So, confound is uh, that's true, but there, uh, confound I would reserve for the case where we have actually multiple independent replicates, but the independent replicates share uh, another variable that is um, that is correlated. So, we often use that in causal observational causal um, analysis, where we say that okay, maybe species richness increases with altitude. But, uh, or sorry, species richness increases with rainfall. But, um, uh, and we think of rainfall as a causal variable, but actually um, temperature, but the rainfall is correlated with altitude and correlated with temperature. So temperature is a potentially a confounding variable. Um, and maybe it's the causal variable is not rainfall, but temperature, those kinds of things. Um, but I, I kind of see what you mean. I, I think it's more important that we understand the underlying uh, factors that um, could lead to a sort of misleading conclusions. That's that's the key thing. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Govind, sir, I'm those who attended the course last year, we couldn't attend the exam. I don't know what your question is, Govind. I'm sure I, I didn't finish the question. Uh, those who couldn't, those who attended the course uh, last year, but couldn't that write the exam? Uh, is there some way they could write the exam this year to complete it? Sorry, I'm, I'm unable to hear. Um, sir, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, I can now, Govind. Yeah, go ahead. Those who couldn't attend the exam last year but attended the course, could they write the exam this year uh, to compensate? Uh, you can, but you need to do all the assignments uh, because the MPTEL requires a certain um, score, uh, average score in the in the weekly assignments as well. So I'm afraid you can't, as far as I understand, use weekly assignments and say and combine that with this year's final exam. I'm afraid you have to, uh, yeah, you have to combine both of those. Is my understanding, and I think uh, Devika or Sonia Chiti can corroborate. So it's one of those NPTEL yeah. uh, requirements. I don't think we can do much about. Uh, are you talking, Govind? You're on mute. I'm on mute, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, the other uh, question over here is uh, <laughs> the field location during the last live interaction. Yeah, so. I don't know how many uh, were here when I was in the, my last live interaction. I showed you uh, from my phone um, the habitat evening, that sir. I was in, which was open habitat. Good Water evening, sir. Reeds. Sorry. Sir. Yeah. Sir, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Sir, can you please give an idea as to how the exam will be conducted? Yeah, I'll take that. I'll just finish this thing. Um, sure. And I'll, sure. So sir. I was sure. um, in. Um, 
This is the question by H. I. I was in Nalsarovar. Uh, Nalsarovar is a large wetland outside uh, near Andabad, and it's a seasonal wetland. It floods in the monsoon and then gradually dries up. And at its largest extent, uh, my uh, what I was told is it reaches 80 or 90 square kilometers uh, just after the monsoon. And uh, for most of its extent, it is uh, less than, um, uh, it's about, a, you know, a few feet in depth. So it's very shallow wetland. And because it's a very shallow wetland, it's extremely productive. So there's lots of uh, plant growth, as you know, in shallow wetlands. There's particular there's plant growth because uh, sunlight reaches and nutrients from the soil can uh, plants can reach uh, get the nutrients from the soil and so on, as opposed to very deep uh, water bodies. So I was in Nalsarovar with thousands and thousands of uh, cranes, common cranes and demoiselle cranes and glossy ibis, and uh, that's where I was. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Now. Um, the question just now was the pattern for the final exam. So I think, please, can you ask that? There's actually, that's already answered in the discussion forum. So if you can please go to the discussion forum and see. Um, I didn't want to repeat uh, things that are already available. Uh, yeah, but it'll be very similar to the assignments, the weekly assignments, except there'll be more questions, 50 questions. Uh, uh, as and opposed it will to... be online, sir, right? No, no. So you please have to look at the NPTEL uh, documentation, okay? Uh, please read the website and come and ask okay. questions which are not there. No? Right, so the right. NPTEL final exam is only in person. There is no okay. option for online exam. You have to okay. go to one of the uh, exam centers. There are some 140 right, right. exam centers. And there is, yeah, so uh, that's where it is. Thank <laughs> you, sir. Thank you. Sure. Um, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Sir, can, sir uh, is there by any chance, could we get the last year exams question papers or something? Um, no, I don't think you can. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, it's something I'm not sure about, Devika and Sonia. No, no sir, uh, we, we are not uh, giving, sir. Yeah, no. yeah. So that's Balaji from MBTEL. So, uh, yeah, that's not... Uh, but the, um, the weekly uh, assignments, uh, you know, give you a good idea of the kind of a question. So, you know, take a look carefully at the weekly assignments. Um, uh, a question from Tarun and Jyotirmay. Jyotirmay, I, I, I'm afraid, you know, this is a little beyond our remit uh, in this live session, Ecological Value of Landscape. Uh, something to ask one of the other instructors, perhaps Umesh uh, or Moshmi. But uh, so I won't take that question now, I'm afraid. But the other one I can take, what's the role of statistics in research design? And in fact, um, uh, you know, statistics is a way of uh, converting the raw data that you've collected into, uh, uh, into some inference that you can make about the question that you posed in the first place. So um, the question, the research design, and the statistical analysis are all very intimately related. And they are related not in a linear way. In other words, you don't just blindly ask the question, then figure out the research design, and then figure out the statistics. Because uh, there is an interplay, a conversation between the three. For example, you might pose a question for which there is no reasonable research design or analysis that could ever answer that question. And so once you have thought through the research and statistical analysis, then you might have to go back to your question and say, look, this is not answerable in the way it's currently posed. And so I may need to rephrase the question. Similarly, you might think of some research design and say, okay, uh, and go and collect data. But then when you come back with the data, you might realize that uh, you are unable to analyze these data in a way that will allow you to answer the question. And so the, in that uh, situation, the statistics, uh, the statistical analysis actually uh, has a role in guiding how you design your research. Um, so when you are thinking about it as a whole, your research project as a whole, uh, don't do it in this linear way. Okay, I'll first think about the research question, then I'll think about the research design, then I'll think about the uh, statistics. Do them together and then see what are the implications of each for the other. And one, I'll leave you with one uh, very uh, clear implication of statistics research design, which is about the precision. Because we want to remember from the lecture, we want to be able to um, capture our population estimate, like the mean, within certain bounds. 
um, if I'm interested in the population density of Chital in some sanctuary, I don't want to have uh, be able to come up with an answer saying that this is the population uh, density of Chital. This is my best guess by best estimate, and it's uh, you know per let's say square kilometer, and it's plus or minus fifty Chital per square kilometer, because plus or minus fifty Chital will give you a range of hundred. Right, and and that's a very large range, a very imprecise range, as opposed to let's say plus or minus ten chital. So suppose our estimate is, um, you know, hundred chital per square kilometer, and in the first case, our range would be fifty to hundred and fifty chital per square kilometer, which is not very satisfactory because our lower estimate is three times less than the higher estimate. Right, so we are very very imprecise, and we haven't really captured the population mean adequately. As opposed to if our estimate is 100 chital plus or minus 10 chital, so then our range of uncertainty is between 90 and 110. That's much better. But how you get to the 50 to 150 versus 90 and 110 is a matter of statistical analysis. And so uh, it's also called power analysis to try and understand uh, the role of sample size given the variation in the population. Uh, in um, influencing what the precision is. And so, uh, as I think I described in the lecture, you would typically go out and collect uh, some pilot data uh, to get some understanding of what's the variation in the population, like the standard deviation um, in the population. And then you would go back to the drawing board and say, okay, for a given precision that I want, let's say plus minus 10 chital per square kilometer, uh, this is the sample size I need. So you'd calculate what sample size you need in order to achieve a precision of plus or minus 10, uh, 10 chital. So that's entirely in the domain of statistics, but the sample size that you choose is in the domain of study design. So statistics is telling you what sample size you need in your study design in order to achieve the precision uh, that's needed for to be able to answer the question you have. So that's one concrete example in how... Um, statistical analysis might influence the research design. Another might be that you can have very complicated research designs, but complicated research designs typically require complicated statistical analyses. And complicated statistical analyses come with a whole bunch of costs. They come with costs of, you know, you have to learn how to do those analyses, but more importantly, you have to learn how to interpret the results of those analyses. And I think there's a pretty much a direct correlation between uh, how complicated a st statistical analysis is and how difficult the results are to interpret. And you may decide that you know, this research design uh, is, has this level of complexity, which requires that level of statistical analysis complexity, uh, which is too, um, uh, too hard to interpret and has too many moving parts, basically. And so you say, well, I will compromise and I'll go with a simpler design, which needs simpler statistics. And I would rather be able to say something confidently about uh, less sophisticated design and analysis versus something where I really don't understand with more complicated design and analysis. So that's another example about, of how uh, statistical complexity at least would influence what you do. And there's papers written and we can pass on the link about uh, you know arguing that in many cases, simpler design followed by simpler statistical analysis in many cases, better uh, than more complex design analysis. Uh, I'm not giving examples because you are not, not um, I mean, in our course, we don't go into complicated statistical analysis, but uh, maybe hopefully intuitively you can see what I mean. And down the line, when if you are research uh, students and research scholars, there'll be a lot of pressure for you to apply complicated statistical analysis uh, because that's what people feel is, it looks fancy, uh, looks, uh, you know, and is therefore more publishable. Uh, but always remember that that comes with a cost. And uh, the cost is really that it's harder to interpret complicated, uh, the results of complex statistical analysis. Okay, I'm just going down the uh, further list here. Doing bird census, how are they able to count abundant, least contained? Punraj, I think you may have to uh, unmute and uh, explain this. I'm not fully able to understand your question, Punraj, if you're here. 
Hello. Yeah, yes. David Pontas here. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, I want to know how they count the abundant birds. And the bird species are more, not the counts. Mm. The number of birds in particular species, no, common species. How they count? Because yeah. they, they just want to know. Because they, they, only that the forest officers or anybody can't know. They, the other citizens also can contribute there. But even though, how mm. no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I understand. Um, yeah. So this is, I'll answer this because it is relevant to study design uh, because it's the protocol that you use when you uh, do bird counts, bird density estimates and so on. And, uh, and, and this, uh, this issue arises uh, particularly in the case when there are large aggregations of birds. So if you have common species that don't aggregate, it's not so difficult. For example, if you have a transect and you're counting crows or pigeons, uh, where pigeons are maybe an aggregating species, but crows, uh, it's not so hard. I walk a one kilometer transect and I keep counting the number of crows, but I'm counting them in ones and twos and threes. So it's not so hard. I can do three plus five makes eight plus two, make, you know, and I can count them as I go along. Uh, but typically, uh, one example where this is a problem is when counting waterfowl. Uh, waterfowl. I, like in Nalsarovar, where I said, you know, there are, let's say, 4,000 cranes. But how do you count 4,000 cranes? They're, they're all aggregated together or they're flying overhead. And it becomes very difficult. And, and so uh, there are some shortcuts. It's hard, you cannot count 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? It's not possible to count 4,000 or in some cases 50,000 by counting 1, 2, 3, 4. So you would typically, if birds are stationary, then you would, and you have a good view, you would typically um, uh, divide up the flock into multiple parts, let's say grids, you would say, okay, this is, I'll divide the flock into four, what look like four roughly equal parts, because the eye is relatively good at dividing uh, a, a, a larger mass into a smaller masses of roughly equal size. And then I might count each part, I might count 10 by 10 or five by five. I say, okay, I'm counting five. This is what five birds look, this is what another five birds look. And so I'm not counting one, two, three, four, I'm counting five, 10, 15, 20. And I count one quarter that way. And then I count the other quarter and the third quarter and the fourth quarter. And then I add them all up. And ideally, I would do that multiple times. Because sometimes I might undercount. Sometimes I might overcount. Uh, sometimes some birds be in, maybe in view, sometimes not. So I might do that multiple times and then take the average of those counts. Uh, so that is one possible situation. It's Again, it's not very uh, accurate in the sense that we are not counting one, two, three. When we come up with an estimate of uh, 50,000, it's not 50,341, right? Because I'm not able to count one by one. I'm only able to count to a precision of, uh, you know, 100 birds or 1,000 birds or something like that. Which when, if we have 50,000 birds, plus or minus 1,000 doesn't really matter so much. But if we have uh, 1,000 birds, then plus or minus 1,000 matters a lot, right? Because then it's zero to 2,000. So when we have fewer birds, we want to be more uh, precise. When we have more birds, we can be uh, less precise. And if birds are flying overhead, that's you know another problem. If they're all flying in the same direction, then at least we can have some way of counting. But if they're all circling around, uh, like many birds do before they uh, roost at night, then it becomes very confusing. You need some kind of method, and it depends on the detail. Huh? The exact method depends on the detail of how these birds are behaving. Are they going in one direction? Are they circling around? Do I have any other way of counting rather than in flight? Can I count them when they are actually settled down and roosting? Can I look from different perspectives? So the specific details will depend. But having said that, maybe in, in some many cases, we don't really need to know the count in precise detail. Um, maybe it's a bias count. We are undercounting or overcounting, and that may be okay as if our purpose is to look at change over time. So as long as it's using the same method, and if we can assume that the bias is the same, then I can count, use this method, uh, you know, this year, I can use it next year, and the third year, and the fourth year. As long as you use exactly the same method, then if we can assume that the bias is the same, that I'm undercounting 20%, because 20% are hidden in the reeds, if I can assume that that bias, whatever it may be, is the same, then the actual, the exact number doesn't matter because I'm actually only interested in the change over time, not in the precise number or the precise density. And in that case, 
if that is your purpose, then uh, we're slightly better off uh, because you don't have to worry so much about things like bias and undercounting, overcounting. But if you if you need to get an accurate number in the here and now, then uh, it's uh, you need to minimize bias, and it's of course more difficult. So I'll just I'll end with that. Okay, one well, can keep talking about uh, <laughs> this, but that I think at a broad level that's a uh, that's reasonable. Uh, Govind says, how's the population status assessed between two or more countries? Oh goodness, this is a very very difficult uh, situation. Um, it is assessed very poorly. Uh, we don't really know because uh, typically uh, the population status or the population density of uh, these birds would be assessed well in one or two places, but not assessed at all in all other places. And so the question is, what do you do? Do you take the assessment uh, where it's available and extrapolate it out to everywhere else? Uh, because that's the only information you have. And that's typically what uh, the IUCN and the Red List uh, does. It says, okay, where do we have reliable, good estimates of population? And then extrapolate to the rest of the range because there's no information from there. Uh, I don't have a good answer to this. Uh, I think it's okay to extrapolate as long as you're very clear that you are extrapolating and you're making the very um, the kind of profound assumption that what... Uh, you are seeing in this small fraction of the range of that species is the same as what's happening in all the rest of the unmeasured part of the range of the species. Uh, and I don't know what you can do better uh, than that, except to, of course, go and do the hard work of setting up monitoring uh, programs in those other unmeasured parts, which, of course, are very difficult. Otherwise, they could have been done already. So I don't have a better answer than that uh, for you. Uh, I think that was Govind. No? Um, Aisha yeah. says, any book? We'll just continue going somebody because we'll, uh, sorry, who's talking? Aisha says, can you suggest any book for statistical analysis of ornithological data? I mean, there is no, um, I wouldn't suggest a book for specifically about ornithological data, but uh, there are books generally about statistical analysis. Um, unfortunately, there's none that I can recommend that uh, really does a, a, an extremely good job. But um, uh, but you can look up uh, the book that I use when I teach this uh, is uh, something called Open, Open Intro Statistics. So Open Intro is a series of textbooks that are um, uh, freely downloadable. Um, and there's a, so Open Intro, if you type that in, Open Intro Statistics in Google, then you will find uh, the Open Intro website, which has multiple textbooks of which uh, statistics is one which you can download for free. And that does as good a job uh, in uh, for describing statistical analysis uh, as any other that I've seen. And that's for basic statistics. Uh, advanced statistics, of course, go in multiple different directions. Dear Enemy Effect is, uh, this is not for me, I think, uh, probably for Manjiri or something like that. Do only songbirds follow this aspect? I don't know enough about the literature uh, on this. I think it's been studied mostly in songbirds, but I will defer to uh, Manji and others. Maybe Tanisha, this is something you can ask in the discussion forum, and one of the other faculty can look at uh, can answer it. Since birds are dinosaurs, is it possible to study avian evolution without a background in paleontology? Well, uh, you can't study deep evolution uh, without knowing something about uh, paleontology and and uh, uh, dinosaurs and reptiles uh, more broadly, but uh, evolutionary studies are <clears throat> uh, are also done at a more shallow level. And by shallow, I don't mean superficial. I mean uh, in less deep time. So over the last few million years, for example, rather than the last tens or hundreds of million years. And if you are interested in ev evolution over the last few million years, then you don't really need to have a background paleontology. One uses anatomical measures or DNA-based molecular measures or behavior-based measures like song to understand divergence and so on. And you don't need a paleontology background. Um, open intro. Okay, Chiti's put that in. That's very nice. Thank you. And Govin, in relation to my previous question, how does it work for migratory or nomadic birds? Yeah, this is about estimating the population status. For migratory birds, it's quite interesting. Uh, I don't have a, a proper answer for you, Govind, but 
I just want to tell you something interesting about some migratory birds uh, that come to India in particular. So there are some migratory species which, uh, which winter in India but breed across entire Eurasia. So for example, red-breasted flycatcher breeds from uh, England in the west to uh, roughly Central Asia uh, in the east, which is a vast area of land. And all red-breasted flycatchers that breed over this vast span of land, they all come down in the winter and, and, we, and spend the non-breeding season in India. So it's a much smaller area in which they concentrate in winter and then they spread back up in um, uh, over across Eurasia in the breeding season. Or Blightstreet Warbler is another species that has a vast breeding range. Uh, Rosy Starling has a smaller breeding range, but still bigger than their wintering range. These species, and there are several others, maybe 10, 15 species, they, they winter almost exclusively in the Indian subcontinent, although they have a very large breeding range. And so what's interesting there is then it becomes much more feasible to understand their population status by monitoring them in their uh, a non-breeding range, which is in India, than it is to monitor them across their vast breeding range. So two interesting things for us, one is uh, for, for India, one is that because we are the custodians of the entire global populations in the non-breeding season, then it becomes very important that we uh, protect their habitats and the birds themselves as well for conservation. And the second implication is that because we know it's impossible for other countries to monitor them across the breeding range, it spans many, many countries, then it's incumbent on, our, on us to monitor their populations in the non-breeding season because that's the only uh, source of information about the global population of these species that will ever be available when we measure them in the non-breeding season. But these are for species that funnel down into such a small area. India is not small, but it's much smaller than their breeding area. Uh, this only applies to those kinds of species. There are other species, of course, that have very large non-breeding ranges and also, uh, sorry, breeding ranges, but also very large non-breeding ranges. And the same questions apply and the difficulties apply in how would we uh, get a comprehensive view of their population status. And I don't have any particular answers. You can imagine how difficult that is. Great. Okay, I think we are at the end of the questions in the chat box and nearly at the end of our time. So just wait for a minute if there are any other questions uh, to type in the chat. Otherwise, we can call it quits. When we started, I thought we'd only be here for 10 minutes, but then some more questions did come. Any um, further questions, either typed or if you want to... Um, of since birds and dinosaurs, no. What happened to that message? Questions are appearing and disappearing on my chat box screen. Sir, uh, as you said that if we take data from a few nets, all the checks, mm -hmm. so pseudo replication of data would uh, affect the conclusion. So, yeah. uh, if uh, we are taking a uh, nest site characteristics data and the uh, uh, species that we are targeting, they are making a uh, few, like uh, three, four individuals have made nest on a single tree. So yeah. again, all those uh, values would be same for those uh, nests, except the nest height. So will that also affect our uh, the results of nest site characteristics? If uh, like uh, if, uh, the total number of uh, nests are around 30 and out of which uh, four are on one tree and like three are on, like seven are on two. Reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asha, I think that um, uh, pseudo replication and non independence, um, its existence and uh, its uh, the problems it causes, also depends on the question you're asking. The you know at what level are you asking this question? Uh, for example, I don't know if I gave this example in the lecture, but um, if I want to, uh, uh, so so weaver birds nest in colonies and you know on trees and groups of nests on the same tree, as you said. And if I have a question about, uh, let's say, for example, do, <clears throat> do trees with uh, more nests uh, suffer less predation through something called a dilution effect, then my level of measurement shouldn't be the individual nest, but it should be the tree as a whole, the colony as a whole. So I need to find multiple colonies, each with different numbers of nests. And I look at what fraction of each of those nests gets destroyed by a predator. 
and then I do a correlation. So each data point in my correlation uh, graph is a colony. On the other hand, if my question is um, within a colony tree, are nests that are higher up safer for predation than nests that are lower down? Then I want to look within a tree and uh, look at the height of each nest and see uh, what the probability of surviving is according to height. So each data point there might be uh, an individual nest. And of course, I need to do this across colony trees. A single Taking a single tree is not sufficient to conclude anything about the population as a whole. So I need to do look within the, a tree at the different nest heights in relation to predation, uh, but also replicate that over multiple uh, trees. So depending on what my question is, I would sometimes take, take an individual nest as a data point and sometimes take uh, a colony tree as a data point which has multiple nests in it. So uh, you have to think carefully about what the question is and at what level of measurement uh, does it make sense to uh, define a sampling unit and where pseudo replication may or may not uh, apply. A more common uh, situation is, and this will be very obvious to you from this example, if I want to ask if uh, whether nests on thorny trees are safer from predation than nests on non-thorny trees, because the weavers do nest on thorny and non. So I find one thorny tree with 30 nests and one thorny tree with 25, uh, non-thorny tree with 25 nests. And I've got one tree and one tree. And I look at the survival rate of nests on that one thorny individual tree and survival rate of nests on the one thorny non uh, one non-thorny individual tree. And I find, let's say, that there's a difference and the non-thorny tree, there's more predation. And you can see uh, already that this is not a good, uh, a not good evidence to uh, infer something about generally, is it a good idea? Is it safer on thorny trees than non-thorny tree, trees? What I can conclude that is that it's better to be on this particular tree compared to that particular tree and it happens to be that this tree is thorny and that happens to be that tree is not thorny. But there are many other things. The thorny tree may be a taller tree, maybe over water, uh, maybe in a different landscape uh, with fewer bushes and so fewer places for predators to hide. And the non-thorny tree may be in a different you know, situation. So actually what we need is multiple thorny trees, multiple colonies on thorny trees and multiple colonies on non-thorny trees, all in different landscapes and different situations, all mixed up. But even though it's quite obviously absurd in the example I gave, <clears throat> in ecology, people often do something very similar uh, where they might say, okay, I have one forest which where there's, uh, let's say, grazing and one forest where there's no grazing. And I want to look at the bird populations here and do lots of transects and lots of plots in the grazed forest and one lots of transects or plots in the ungrazed forest. <clears throat> and I find there's a difference and I attribute that difference to the presence or absence of grazing. But that's actually pseudo replication because I have only one forest. Uh, I don't have, haven't looked across multiple forests. So I can conclude that this forest has more birds than that forest. But to attribute that difference to the fact that this is grazed and that is ungrazed is very uh, risky because this forest is different in so many other ways than the other forest, apart from just being grazed or ungrazed. So that's another example where there is pseudo replication. We have to think, but if our purpose is to find out whether this forest is different from that forest, forest A is different from forest B, then it's not pseudo replicated because we want to restrict our generalization just to this forest, one forest here and one forest there. We're not generalizing beyond that. So whether it is not pseudo replication depends on your question and also what you, uh, what you want to generalize to. I hope that made sense. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Gaurav says, couldn't hear the reference name provided for studying avian evolution. I didn't mention any, uh, I think, reference instead of faculty name. Um, Govin says, okay, population of extinct animals. This is going beyond my uh, expertise. So I, I'm afraid I can't answer the last two questions. Um, Sir, if you are doing total count in an area, yeah. Code, so uh, in non-breeding season, uh, the area is divided into blocks, and we are counting all the individuals of a particular species, say for darter. Mm -hmm. And in breeding season, we are only counting uh, the number of nests and chicks. So, will that give a like in breeding? If we are only counting the nests, so that would be correct to count, or we need to look for if they 
is it there is a possibility like there may be some pairs who are not breeding in that uh, season or yeah. like will that give an actual number of uh, total number of uh, daughters in that area in breeding or yeah no counting the nest doesn't give you a, a number of uh, total number and this is true for uh, uh, colonial water breeding water birds like darters it's also true for passing like songbirds and so on we know that in uh, all songbirds that have been studied i think uh, that um, there are breeding pairs that uh, make nests and raise chicks but there are also something called floaters individuals that uh, have not been able to find a mate or are not in breeding condition and therefore pass through the habitat and don't uh different territories and don't breed now whether or not you want to include non breeding individuals uh depends on the purpose so for example from a conservation point of view or from a productivity point of view or a demographic point of view uh excuse me it's only the breeding individuals that are contributing to the next generation so it's the number of breeding in pairs or the number of nests that actually uh determine how many chicks are going to be there how many young ones are going to be there in the next generation so if you care about those kinds of things then counting nests or breeding pairs may be perfectly fine uh you might be perfectly justified in ignoring the non breeding pairs uh because that's what matters for your question but if your question is something different for example if your question is about the carrying capacity of a habitat how many birds can a habitat uh, support then we're talking about all the birds all the birds that are using resources let's say darters uh, whether or not they are breeding um, and so uh, you really have to think very carefully about what precisely is it that you want to take away so it's so this is bringing out the point that it's not just enough to say oh i need to go and count the count birds you need to ask yourself why you are count for what purpose are you counting birds uh and what are the um, results of that study going to tell you or tell management or tell conservation or whatever else and only when you have thought carefully about that and and defined that will you be able to uh decide whether it makes sense to just count the nests which is much easier certainly than counting individual birds or whether you need to count the individual birds uh whether or not they are breeding so in all cases uh, you know uh, the question that you have and the purpose for which you're collecting the data that is the supreme thing that is the the uh, aspect that has to guide all aspects uh of your research design and data collection uh and therefore one shouldn't blindly go into data collection um without having defined as carefully and closely as possible what is it that we want to achieve through this data collection uh i hope that makes sense ash uh, if it's just to know the abundance in bharatpur of da- the bhar- abundance of bhar- bhar- data in bharatpur so uh, in breeding we need to uh, count the non breeding pairs also i mean i don't know why do you want to know the abundance that's the question I, I, just try like i'm just asking if uh... no no but uh, you, i i you know i i don't know what i can do more than repeat what i said earlier you only know why you want to know the abundance okay. no if you want to keep track of you know how many uh uh daughters are contributing to uh, population in the next generation then breeding pairs is enough okay right? if uh, and, uh, yeah if there is any disturbance because of which uh, uh, they are moving outside the area protected area or if there is any kind of poaching or something Uh, sorry complete that thought then what like just to know if the area uh, if uh, there is more disturbance in this breeding area than the previous one that's why the number has decreased in the breeding pair that you won't know no you won't know unless you have some additional measure that directly relates disturbance or poaching with the numbers right just okay. just tracking the numbers won't tell you anything about why the numbers are changing no so you have to carry out additional studies and additional data collection to uh figure out why and like i mentioned in the uh, earlier lecture on asking questions i think it was that um, counting is one thing you can see the birds directly but to find out causes of population change that's not observable directly so we have to hypothesize different possible causes based on our understanding of the situation and our understanding of ecology and then we have to predict make predictions about what we should see if this is the cause or that's the cause so that that goes now beyond simply counting 
and uh, you know into a more complicated uh, matter of inferring unobservable um, phenomena from uh, observable counts or whatever uh, design that we have so i think uh, again when we say abundance we have to ask why we care about abundance i i would think that from a at least from a conservation point of view just to to close this if we care most then if we can restrict our counts to breeding individuals only then that makes sense because it's only those individuals that contribute to the next generation non breeding individuals by definition don't contribute to the next generation um and so from a conservation point of view they are dead they are as good as dead non breeding individuals right so um but if your purpose is not conservation but something else then uh, we you know and there could very well be then you might want the total population which may be easier or more difficult to get depending on the circumstances thank you sir thanks asha i think we need to draw to a close what do you think um, sonia yeah uh, i think we can close it now yeah so uh, uh, do feel free to post uh, any questions that have been unanswered or that come up later on in your mind please post in the discussion forum uh, and uh, i'll i'll take a look and be sure to answer those questions yeah so yeah thank you so any anything last things yeah. from you uh i think it's fine i think how uh, we can uh, like uh, post the questions in the discussion forum sounds good yeah. okay uh-huh. great yeah thank you all okay then thank you and bye thank bye you bye.